I remember what I thought on stage. That even if they all died for their ideals, it'd be worth it. In the world of cyberpunk, rocker boys are rebellious musicians who use music to revolt against authority. They're a lot like the 80s punk rockers who look down on corporate sellouts as traitors to the craft. And because they're so charismatic, they can inspire and charm a large number of people through their musical performances. Johnny Silverhand, the lead singer of the band Samurai, is no different. After participating in the Second Central American War and witnessing the suffering corpse and governments produce firsthand, he never looked back during his path to dismantle it all. But being the irrational, impulsive, and manipulative person many know him to be, there's nuance intertwined with his story and of course, it can even be argued he is the main character of cyberpunk. But don't let that description confuse you into thinking Silverhand is the quote unquote good guy. In cyberpunk, there really are no good guys. So what makes Silverhand unique to the rest of Night City Legends and why is he so central to the world? Today. I will be unraveling the entirety of Johnny Silverhand's story. Some of this video will not initially line up with what you believe to be true, as the story told through Silverhand's perspective in 2077 doesn't line up side by side with the tabletop RPGs. But yes, they are confirmed canon by CD Projekt Red and the creator, Mike Pondsmith. There is reasoning behind it all, and I will explain in this video. It all makes sense soon. so. Without further delay, let's begin unraveling the legend of Johnny Silverhand. Silverhand was born to the name Robert John Linder in College Station, Texas, on November 16, 1988. By the time Johnny even had self-awareness, his life was already tossing him out into the wilderness. I'll actually let an interview with Mike Pondsmith take over this portion. Never Fade Away only gave you a narrow picture of what he yeah. was like is that Johnny Johnny's a very cold son of a bitch and that yeah. was you know the way I always saw him was you know this is one seriously damaged person I mean um, I actually have a story around um, I've been building kind of the, the uh, history of Johnny Silverhand and you know it starts off with the opening scene of his dad selling him at the age of four for uh, basically a pack of cigarettes and oh that's <laughs> the good stuff, you know, and how he ends up basically eventually ending up with, you know, a, a nomad group that takes him in. And that in itself is a an episode of interesting violence. So, yeah, Johnny is messed up. These nomads would provide a sense of familial bond that Johnny never had the pleasure of experiencing before. He finally had a home and it was wherever the road took these nomads while growing up. Silverhand's rocker roots would begin to take form as he came to idolize Wendy O. Williams, lead singer of the punk band Plasmatics, considering her the toughest rocker girl to ever be. While Silverhand was forming his idolations, massive shifts were taking place in the world, the most impactful of which to America and Silverhand's story was the previous formation of the Gang of Four, a political cabal comprised of the NSA, CIA, FBI, and DEA formed at some unspecified time in the mid 20th century. This group managed to amass boundless political and military influence, operating in an extrajudicial manner and with no congressional oversight. So what did this group do with all of this power? Solve poverty, feed the hungry, end wars? Well, of course not. They instead engaged in espionage and stock market manipulation, kicking off wars and causing the crash of 94. During this collapse, federal bonds were being sold at such a rapid pace that the federal government had to print money to be able to buy them, rapidly devaluing the American dollar and causing massive inflation. Widespread unemployment and civil unrest soon followed, leading to prolific violence and extreme poverty. These were the harsh times that Silverhand grew up in, the consequences of the Gang of Four's actions. Though this obviously wasn't known by the average person. So Silverhand, like many others, still had a strong sense of nationalism, leading him to enlist in the military as a 15-year-old after lying about his age. It is currently unknown what happened to his previous nomad group and if it was instrumental in pushing him toward a life in the military so early. Whether it was looking for a purpose or if pulling out that occurred, we are yet to know. 
the Second Central American War of 2003, a U.S. invasion of Colombia, Ecuador, Peru, was in full force during this time, meaning it didn't take long for him to see action. He was quickly sent to Nicaragua, a devastating conflict perpetrated by the corrupt and manipulative U.S. government. During this war, Silverhand would experience firsthand the suffering caused by a corrupt war, during which his life was saved by a friend who died protecting him. When the government's secrets were exposed, many American soldiers dropped their banners and fought back by deserting the military. In response, the government used its influence to launch a powerful propaganda campaign against these former soldiers and convince the American public to despise them as deserters. John became one of many who decided he would no longer fight in the corrupt war that ultimately led to him losing his arm and his friend. He deserted and left for Night City, staying at the Hotel Pista Sofia for a whole month after his arrival. The military and the war had changed his life forever. He obviously had chosen to not return to the nomads around this time. Again, while the reason is unknown, nomads are always on the move, so tracking them down might have been beyond his cares or goals. John then changed his name to Johnny Silverhand, with his new surname referencing the bionic arm he had implanted to replace his left. Johnny started his mission of rebellion and exposing corruption by starring a rock band with his friend, Carrie, originally only playing in backstreet clubs. Their first gig ever was played at the Red Dirt Bar. They would eventually be known as Samurai, though this name wasn't actually thought up by Johnny or Carrie. It was coined by Nancy Hartley, inspired by the fact that historical samurai were willing to die for their cause, even if it was immoral or just plain wrong. Nancy believed that kind of blind loyalty was stupid, and so she decided to take the name and turn it around into a street meaning, as a form of mockery. Of course, Johnny and Carrie just thought it sounded cool. One night in 2003, after playing in the Rainbow Condensa, the band was approached by a Blitzdorfer, who offered to sign them after witnessing their impressive act. This man turned out to be none other than Jack Masters, the head executive at Universal Music at the time. Samurai would be officially comprised of the co-founders, Johnny and Carrie, as well as Denny, Nancy Hartley, and Henry. Within three weeks, Samurai was signed, had a record in production, and was preparing to tour every major city in the world. It took only these three weeks for their first single, Blistering Love, to achieve number one on the Euro charts, which soon they followed up with the album, being one of the few times a debut album achieved such status in such a short time. Johnny's music became revolutionary, kickstarting the rocker boy movement and becoming an overnight sensation. During the next years, Sam Wright toured around the world, playing concerts with an audience of thousands of people, even managing to sell out the whole Wembley Stadium. They released a total of six albums, with three being studio work and the other three being concerts and jam sessions optioned by Universal. In early 2007, the band suffered a blow that would later be decisive. Their keyboardist, Nancy, was dating a guy whom she eventually married. The rest of the band members didn't see it at first, but 10 weeks after the ceremony, they realized Nancy's husband was mistreating her. One day, she finally got the courage to talk about it with the other members after her husband tried to force her to quit Samurai. For Johnny and Carrie, that was the last straw, and the same day they decided to go to their apartment to kick his ass. But by the time they got there, it was already too late. Nancy's husband had started to beat her again. Deciding she'd had enough, threw him out the window of their 83rd story apartment. Nancy was shortly arrested, and after the trial, she was sentenced to seven months in prison. During the time span, the band firmly supported her. By 2008, Nancy finally got out of jail, focusing on returning with the rest of Samurai. Unfortunately, those seven months of inactivity had put a split in the band that they were not able to heal, eventually realizing they were each going on different creative directions. Soon afterward, they all went on their separate ways, marking the end of Samurai. Johnny and Carrie were still some of the most popular musicians at the time, and of course started solo careers. Johnny used this opportunity to push his anti-corporation and anti-government message. By then, DBS Music wanted to sign Johnny so desperately that they blackmailed him, threatening to reveal his true identity as a deserter of the Second Central American Conflict. In defiance of the blackmail attempts, 
Johnny instead signed once again with Universal Music, releasing a complete album entitled Sins of Your Brothers, in which he admitted to being a deserter and revealed all the terrible actions the government had ordered its military to carry out. The album was of course a wide success, and changed public perception of what it meant to be a deserter. Johnny continued his rebellious campaign in the 2010s. During this time, he performed his famous free benefit concert in Japantown to call attention to the brutal methods the NCPD used to quell the homeless riots. Johnny's relationship with Rogue also ended at some point in 2011 after she discovered that he had cheated on her. Around this time, Silverhand found himself in a heated argument with an Arasaka exec over a parking space. After getting in his face and both sides relentlessly refusing to admit wrongdoing, Johnny got sick of it and just shot out the tires on the exec's car, which happened to be a classic 911 Porsche, and this exec actually turned out to be Toshiro Haruda, who he would come to meet again later down the line. Not before returning at some point and stealing that same Porsche though. So yeah, that's how Johnny got his classic Porsche that we find in 2077. It also lends some more validity as to why Silverhand thinks Arasaka is just getting back at him in this upcoming story. After giving a concert at the Hammer on August 4th, 2013, Johnny reconnected with his former girlfriend, Alt Cunningham. When the two went for a walk that night, they were ambushed by a group of thugs hired by Arasaka. These thugs injured Johnny severely and kidnapped Alt as a helpless Johnny watched them take off in a van. Unknown to Johnny, a media reporter named Lyle Thompson had seen everything and got Johnny to medical care quick enough to save him. It was revealed that Thompson had been trailing Alt Cunningham as he knew about her creation of Soul Killer and Arasaka's desire to get their hands on it. Silverhand was pissed and he knew what he had to do. On the 5th of August 2013, Johnny gathered a strike team consisting of his ex-girlfriend and solo, rogue, media reporter, Lyle Thompson, and the nomad leader of the Aldecados, Santiago, in order to infiltrate Arasaka Tower in Night City to save Alt Cunningham. As a diversion, he called in a favor from all the members of his old band. Samurai gathered together to perform an entirely free show directly in front of the complex. Samurai's performance led to a riot aimed at the tower as troops were called in to control the situation. Unbeknownst to Johnny at the time, Arasaka had kidnapped Alt specifically to force her to develop a new version of the Soul Killer software she had written for ITS. In a panic reaction to the assault, Toshiro Harada used Soul Killer on Alt while the assault took place, trapping her inside the Arasaka mainframe. As Johnny and his team infiltrated the tower, Alt attempted to find a way to escape the mainframe and return to her body. While making their way to the Soul Killer Labs, the rush of emotions and surrounding violence had started reigniting something within Johnny, more specifically, within his silver cyberarm. Johnny was beginning to display symptoms of cyberpsychosis that reached all the way to his Melorian. Why to his Melorian though? Well, it was a one-of-a-kind creation specifically for the Rocker Boy equipped with a prototype smart link and was left-handed to be sported with his arm, packing a shot so powerful that his fleshy right arm wouldn't be able to handle it anyway. But it wasn't its firepower that created a problem, it was the smart link. Even just using Silverhand's Melorian can technically invoke a sense of cyberpsychosis, as the smart link overrides your body to create better precision while shooting, removing the sense of guilt and hesitation someone with empathy might usually feel when killing another living being. Paired with Silverhand's PTSD, personality, and troubled past, his arm would begin taking a mind of its own, being referred to as the hand. It was Johnny's cyberpsycho expression. Internally, Johnny would treat any horrible thing he does as the hand took over. The team managed to reach the room where Toshiro and Akira were keeping Alt. All Johnny could see was Alt's lifeless body. His mind became clouded as his cyberarm began to convulse in fury by his side, locking the Melorian and slow-slung hip rig. The metal fingers locked to the grip. This time, he had no reason to stop it. Johnny allowed the hand to take aim, placing a red pinpoint on Toshiro's forehead. The hand convulsed. Bang, says the gun, as Toshiro collapses to the ground. Johnny then disconnected all from the net running chair she was plugged into, assuming she had died as he gathered her still warm body in his arms. Behind the wall of monitors, 
A disembodied alt screamed out to Johnny, but he could not hear her. It is unknown what Johnny did with Alt Cunningham's body, but we know that it held a faint pulse despite her disembodiment. For how long it would stay this way is also unknown. But in the Cyber Generations timeline, Johnny Silverhand puts the Mindless Husk into a cold sleep. While this is considered a separate timeline from canon, released before the Firestorm series, many of its details and plotlines were used for the following canon releases. After the assault on the tower, Johnny and Santiago left Night City and went into hiding with the Aldecado's nomad family. For one reason or another, Johnny had returned to his younger roots, likely finding comfort in the lifestyle. In 2015, the two finally returned from Mexico City. Little is known of what Johnny did during this time, but it was around 2015 that a firefighter by the name of Samantha Stevens saved him from a fire in one of his studios. Around 2020, Johnny gave an interview in which he reminisced about a girl he had fallen for. She had told him she was born in Miami around 2004, as she could still remember the destruction of Tampa. Johnny mentioned that she had a biosculpt smile and blue Technic 2350 eyes, though he did not care how much of her was quote unquote real. In 2023, Johnny had begun work on a new song in one of his studios which would eventually be credited under the name Samurai, but during this time the song would remain unreleased. The fourth corporate war had begun to reach its peak. Not only this, but an important revolution had been brought to his attention. The woman he loved, the woman he had lost to the hands of Arasaka, was actually alive. No, her body hadn't risen to consciousness, rather she was in the net the disembodied engram that Silverhand had no previous awareness of. She had been aiding Militech with the help of Raish Bartmoss and Spider Murphy in the Fourth Corporate War, but unfortunately, had been captured by Arasaka once again, now trapped in their network. But the Netrunner, Spider Murphy, had clued Silverhand in on a plan Militech was forming, and without a second thought, he chose to participate, all at the chance of rescuing his lover. Ahead of this coordinated attack, Johnny and Carrie performed their last ever gig together in The Hammer, which would be the last time both Rocker Boys ever saw each other. On August 20th, 2023, Johnny and Morgan Blackhand, alongside Rogue, Shayton, Thompson, and Spider Murphy, led a Militech assault team on the Arasaka Towers in Night City, with the intention of destroying the towers with a mini-nuke and ultimately ending the Fourth Corporate War. After infiltrating the rooftop and making quick work of its security systems, Shrike Team Alpha, led by Silverhand, made their way to the Soul Killer Labs. Here, Spider would connect directly to the Arasaka mainframe and successfully liberate Alt. Unfortunately, this accomplishment was short-lived. A sudden explosion into the labs revealed Arasaka forces led by the Atom Smasher. Johnny's team was pinned down. Everyone dived to find cover against the onslaught of bullets, while Spider Murphy had to make a split-second decision. She took all the icons that composed Alt Cunningham's engrammatic data and scattered them across the net, to hopefully retrieve at a later time. Johnny, who had barely managed to find cover, was conflicted on what to do next. He felt that during his first attack on the towers, he had failed Alt, and this time, he was determined to not fail her again. Making a rash but brave decision, with a Militech SMG in one hand and his Malorian arms in the other, Johnny resolved to leave cover, shouting at and provoking Smasher while emptying his ammo into the Borg. Smasher, surprised at Silverhand's audacity, paused for one moment, and then whipped around and fired his auto shotgun at Silverhand, ripping the rocker boy in half. Silverhand fell to the ground with a surprised look on his face, his Malorian still smoking. It only took a second, but this stalled enough time for Shaitan to emerge from camouflage behind Smasher and immobilize him, granting the rest of the team the chance to escape. Spider Murphy tried to reach to the barely alive Johnny, but she was stopped by Rogue, who told her he was gone. Spider, knowing she couldn't extract him, reached inside her jacket to pull out a data slug all had given to her long ago, and as she whispered to Johnny that she was sorry, she inserted the chip into the back of the dying rocker boy's skull. She then reached for her data suitcase, quickly realizing it had been destroyed in the crossfire, and then escaped with Rogue knowing that both Johnny and Raish Bartmoss would one day be avenged. Johnny's engram on the relic in 2077 holds a different tale of the events. In Johnny's version, he escaped the initial fight with Smasher and attempted to reach the helicopter where Rogue was waiting. 
but was again cut off by Smasher. Johnny was then presumed gunned down by the Borg and dead, but was instead recovered and detained by Arasaka. According to the Ingram, while in the custody of Arasaka, Johnny was interrogated first by the corpse security and then later by Saburo Arasaka himself with the assistance of a techie. He was subjected to the Soul Killer program, in which his consciousness was scanned and stored on an engram as his physical body died. He was then allegedly buried under concrete in the oil fields just outside of Night City. Despite there being no body to intern, a niche was dedicated to Johnny's memory at the North Oak Columbarium. His epitaph, which uses his real name, reads, Robert John Linder, son of a bitch who never gave up, a legend among legends. So why were these events so distorted in Silverhand's memory? Well, Chum, you'll need some more explanation before we get to that. Sorry. Not long after the 2023 AHQ incident, Firefighter and Johnny Silverhand fan, Samantha Stevens, accessed the hot zone after receiving a request from her close friend, Angel. There, Samantha recovered a non-detonated mini nuke from a wrecked bunker of the destroyed towers, one that was owned by the Arasaka Corporation. She later tossed its contents in a Del Coronado Bay. After finding Johnny's body among the ruins, she placed it into the nuke crate to preserve it. At some point, Samantha also recovered several of Johnny's possessions, including one of his Malorian arms and his Porsche. Along with the bomb case, she hid these items in her garage somewhere in Night City, where she protected and took care of them for years. There's actually an entire story about this that was meant to be in Aftershocks, the unreleased third book of the Firestorm series for Cyberpunk 2020. The reasoning behind why it wasn't was actually stated by Mike. There is an entire short story I wrote that happens at Ground Zero that day, and how Samantha ended up with Johnny's body. I was planning to put it in Aftershocks the day I finished the story. In fact, about 20 minutes after, somebody flew a plane into the last of the Twin Towers and suddenly, it was no longer appropriate to release it in the face of so much real-world death." End quote. This is also the probable reason as to why the dual 2020 Arasaka Towers were retconned in favor of a singular tower. During the time of Red, after encountering a group of Edge Runners who were trying to find an unreleased song by Silverhand, Samantha tasked Roop with transporting the crate containing Johnny's body to Los Alamos Labs in New Mexico. Before they left, Samantha took one of them, a mercenary known as Zara, aside and gifted her the Malorian. She told Zara that the owner was never going to use it again, adding that Zara seemed the right person to carry it for him. The group of edge runners, after several encounters along the journey, even one with Michiko Arasaka that was much friendlier than expected, managed to deliver the crate to Angel in New Mexico, a woman who bared a shocking resemblance to the Alt Cunningham. After explaining its importance, giving thanks, and of course, a copy of the promised unreleased song titled Black Dog, the Edge Runners left, leaving Angel alone with the new crate. After opening it up and revealing the cold, preserved body, she whispered, Hello, my love. Between this delivery in 2045 and the year of 2077, we can only really speculate at the moment, seeing as there's been no adventures or stories to follow it all up. But we can assume, based on what we know, that Adam Smasher and, in turn, Arasaka, had managed to track down Johnny Silverhand's belongings as well as his engram, apparently leaving Adam in charge of his body and possessions. During this era, Hanako Arasaka, a highly skilled netrunner, had taken interest in the work of Alt Cunningham, being one of the few to exist to actually grasp the true meaning of her work. Having always been reclusive, she preferred to work on her digital projects, particularly on a revised version of Soul Killer, with the aim of transferring engrams into clone bodies. This would end up laying the foundation for Sabro's personal commission, The Relic. At some point prior to 2077, Johnny Silmerhand's engram was copied onto a prototype version of the Relic, known as Relic 2.0. This device was then stolen by Yorinobu Arasaka, and stored within a secure vault in Kompeki Plaza, in an attempt by Yorinobu to bait his father, Saburo, out into the public. The engram and its location were uncovered by the Voodoo Boys, who then planned to steal it and use it to establish contact with Alt Cunningham, and pass through the Black Wall. 
The Voodoo Boys hired Evelyn Parker to record a brain dance of the room and determine its security measures, as well as the location of the relic. Evelyn instead decided to betray the Voodoo Boys and steal the device for herself to sell to Netwatch. Using fixer Dexter Deshawn, she hired mercenaries V and Jackie Wells to steal the relic from Yorinobu's room. During this mission, the two mercenaries were nearly successful in stealing the relic without getting caught, but their heist quickly fell apart after the unexpected murder of Saburo by his son. During the mercenaries' improvised escape, the relic storage case was damaged. To ensure the relic's preservation, a wounded Jackie inserted it into a shard slot, then later placed it into V's hands as he lied dying of his wounds in the Delamain cab. Immediately after Jackie's death outside of a no-tell motel, V inserted the relic into their own shard slot. Because of this, the relic activated upon V's murder at the hands of Deshaun, preserving V's life and finally awakening Johnny's engram. It then began transferring the engram to V's brain, overriding the mercenary's consciousness without Johnny's digital personality, just as it was programmed to do. Initially attacking V in a bid to take over their mind and body, Johnny eventually decided to cooperate with V to ensure his own survival, or at least ensure the relic's retrieval from V's head. Johnny appeared to V on numerous occasions, often either to provide advice to V or to offer his thoughts respective situations. Johnny also attempted to take control of V's body on a handful of occasions, and the relic itself placed V into glimpses of Johnny's memories, including his attempt to save all in 2013 and his final attack on the Arasaka Towers in 2023. The fate of the Ingrammatic Silverhand comes down to the choices made at the end of a game. The devil ending will result in the relic being removed and V left only a husk of their former self, leaving V to become an Ingram or reject Arasaka's offer and return to Earth to die. The tower is somewhat of a parallel to the devil, being that V sides with the Corp Militech and his Silverhand ripped from their mind, though this time V lives on without Cyberware or Johnny, left to begin life anew. The rest of the endings are ultimately narrowed down to one of the two outcomes. Johnny Silverhand takes over the body of V and lives on in the year of 2077, choosing to leave Night City feeling grateful to live again, but also sad over V's fate. Or Johnny Silverhand follows Alt Cunningham beyond the Black Wall to be with the rest of the AI, similar to himself. And that is obviously where the story of Silverhand ends, at least when it comes to lore exposition. But there's something I've been edge running you all about. Why do the memories of Silverhand as experienced in 2077 not align with those presented in the tabletop RPGs? Well, there are several reasons behind this, some backed by the creators and some backed by in-game context. And of course, after this, we will be returning to just why a woman so similar to Alt Cunningham was retrieving the preserved body of Johnny Silverhand, who, keep in mind, still had that chip, presumably containing his engram inserted by Spider Murphy. So to kick it off, we have some reasoning provided by the creator of the TTRPGs, Mike Pondsmith. He states on his Reddit account, Johnny's recollection of the events that day are scrambled from the rad damage his body took and the process of recording his engram. CDPR and I have both agreed that Johnny is an unreliable narrator at best." End quote. So radiation damage happens to be one of the reasons listed as to why these memories are inaccurate. It is implied though that there's other reasoning behind it that both CD Projekt Red and Mike himself had come up with. So let's dig a bit deeper here. The first of which being the unreliable narrator perspective. Why exactly would Silverhand himself have fabricated these details? Well, we actually have Old Cunningham to answer this in 2077. Your death wasn't Johnny's fault. How could you know? Seen you in his memories. It was an accident. What you saw was his subjective view of what happened. A warped account of events he locked away in his subconscious and replayed time and again. It bears no resemblance to the truth. Silverhand has been trapped in Soul Prison for well over 50 years by the point of 2077, truly with nothing but his own thoughts. Better yet, 
His engram is designed to be more human despite its AI nature. Then alongside the damage it's incurred, it makes sense that Silverhand wouldn't be able to recall these events vividly. There would be gaps to fill in and data loss as time went on. Meaning that Silverhand isn't necessarily actually lying to us, he genuinely believes what he is saying. The best example of this phenomena is during his 2023 memories. When he initially encounters Smasher, it plays out somewhat similarly to the tabletops. A huge explosion, Adam Smasher with Arasaka troops, but this time, he's all alone. There's no one near him to save. There's no reason for him to die here. It's excluding information to make sense of it all, which all the more leads up to a sudden cut when you think he might die. A cut from an inescapable moment that finds him on the rooftop, back with his crewmates. A last ditch effort to survive, but this time, when he slips and falls, it ultimately allows his crew to escape the clutches of Adam Smasher. In reality, the legend to fight Smasher on the top of Arasaka Towers was Morgan Blackhand, Militech's top solo. This is where his memories just might branch off to something more than just attempting to fill in the blanks. So there's two ways to look at this. The Ingram is trying to make sense of just how it could have been created without the knowledge of Spider Murphy being in possession of the Soul Killer program. The next assumption would be that Arasaka nabbed up Silverhand and ultimately soul killed him. This next idea though implies that this change wasn't produced by the fault of the Ingram, rather it was tampered with. So either Angel, who came into possession of the chip, altered the memories to protect Spider Murphy, or Arasaka, who eventually took possession, altered the chip to create a false interrogation scene, one in which the Ingram would believe everything happening was real, rather than just being in soul prison. And I'm going to quickly list a couple of other inconsistencies for completion's sake, the most commonly mentioned in my comments being Rogue's quote right before the raid on Arasaka Tower. Not, Not this, this time, time honey. honey! In many people's minds, this quote would imply that Rogue had at some point let Silverhand slip out of a helicopter. The implication being that in his 2023 flashback, Rogue is unable to bring Silverhand up into the heli before Smasher arrives. Though we know this couldn't be a true event, so how do we explain it? Well, keep in mind that Rogue is the one to tell Murphy that they need to leave Silverhand behind while he lay there dying. She likely feels responsibility for his death, and in that case, it just makes sense that she would view it as letting him go, which would parallel this quote pretty well. Of course, the two have a long history together as well, so this really could have happened at some other point, or it's just an oversight by the developers. There's one more note I'd like to mention on this topic. Take notice that besides Johnny, the relic is very capable of altering your reality. For example, Johnny himself moving objects around. Would it really be so surprising that while in Johnny's view, we get an unreliable perspective? Another inconsistency is the Ingram's claim that Johnny participated in the Second Central American War in Mexico while in reality, he was sent to Nicaragua. Then, there's the Ingram stating that his dog tanks originally belonged to a soldier who sacrificed his life to save Johnny during the war. Despite this, the tanks have Johnny's original name, not that of his brother-in-arms. Obviously, this could spark some doubt in what Silverhand's true name is, but because of the tabletop RPGs and even the 2013 flashback, we know his name is truly Robert John Linder, so in all likelihood, Silverhand just considers himself a separate person from who he once was, that thanks to his time in the military, he opened his eyes to the corruption surrounding him. So we now understand the reasoning behind Silverhand's false memories, for the most part. But what you don't understand is the story behind Angel and the preservation of Johnny Silverhand's body. Well, canonically, there's really not much to say but we can definitely make some connections and inferences using a separate timeline from the main series, the Cyber Generation Sourcebook. This timeline was a sort of superhero spin on the series, focusing more on the idea of saving the world rather than saving yourself. The story centered around 
teenagers with unusual superhuman skills gain from a nanotech virus called the Carbon Plague, which still appears in canon but is quickly contained. Which is a good starting point, as a large portion of this book is recycled into canon in some way, shape, or form. Many of the details now considered canon were actually established in Cyber Generation, since it seems to primarily branch off at the outbreak of the Carbon Plague. So characters who had their backgrounds established in this book, such as Raish Bartmas or Morgan Blackhand, remain for the most part canon. Just like many other Night City legends, we can also find the stories of Johnny Silverhand and Alt Cunningham that seem to connect just a bit too well to the Black Dog storyline. Take for example, Alt Cunningham's. Alt Cunningham had been doomed to life as an AI after Johnny Silverhand unplugged her in his rescue attempt, with Silverhand depositing her now mindless husk safely into cold sleep. Of course, not changing anything from previous canon. While we never officially learn of, of what Silverhand did with her body that held a faint pulse, we could assume he wouldn't just give up and dispose of it. Back to Cyber Generation, Alt went on to steal $20 million from the Arasaka mainframe to plan an escape. Using these newly acquired funds, she set up a small, highly secret research corp through her now huge web of investment accounts. Over these nine years, she directed her employees to study the most advanced techniques in cloning technologies, including stolen data on Biotechnica's failed cloning attempts in 2019, with an eye towards replicating her frozen body, which is all tried and true tech in current canon. By 2019, Alt had reversed the soul killer process with a new program. She instructed her employees to bring a cloned body to the lab and prepared the downloading process. But obviously, this being cyberpunk and all, it hadn't gone so smoothly. Instead of her AI conscious being transferred, she had actually transferred her basic personality into a clone. She had learned it was only possible to copy her neural net into the waiting brain. The original remained trapped in the net. Hopeless of her return to reality, she went on to create Shangri-La for the hundreds of soul killer victims and other disembodied personalities transferred into the net. This would be known as the Ghost Town. The very same concept we learned about in Cyberpunk Red and 2077. And here comes Johnny Silverhand, a rocker boy who rather than fall victim to Adam Smasher during a raid on Arasaka, falls victim to a Biotechnica sponsored assassination, only to end up met with an offer by Alt Cunningham's clone while trapped in a Cairo tank with half his body gone. This was the offer to upload his engram to the net via Soul Killer and download him into a suitable body. But there is a secret up Alt's sleeve. This wouldn't be the original Johnny, who was an unaware copy sent out to Rome while the original was data stored for safekeeping. That way, if he ever ended up being killed yet again, Alt too would be capable of farming copies of his engram and body to make more and more. Now take all of this information and plug it into the canon timeline. Everything suddenly makes sense. We understand how Angel can exist and have the resources to get Silverhand's body, not to mention having an unreleased samurai song and laboratory at her disposal. Then, we also can now review just how Angel could get her hands on the engram and body, yet the Silverhand relic can claim he was in soul prison for 50 years. The original version of the engram was never awakened, she only ever copied it in order to preserve the previous. And maybe there's a, th a thought, a theory starting to peek out into your brain. What happened between Angel getting the body and Ingram and Arasaka obtaining it? Well, it's more than likely that at some point, a new Silverhand was walking around the Earth with Angel. Now, whether they were killed when Adam Smasher tracked down Silverhand's possessions, Ingram, and body, or even still alive to the year of 2077 is a whole other debate. And keep in mind after all of this information that the tabletop RPGs are canon to 2077. So really, it's not about if it happened, but instead how it all connects. The details left are mentioned between these informative adventures, the details left for us to figure out as a community, as well as forming our very own adventures around them. And that, Chooms, is everything we currently know about THE Rocker Boy of Legend. Johnny Silverhand. Being the central point of storytelling for Mike Pondsmith's adventures, he's arguably the primary candidate as the main character of Cyberpunk. But after all of this, do you think he can be considered a hero? 
I want to hear all your thoughts down below. I hope you all enjoyed and learned some new information to further your knowledge of the cyberpunk universe. This video utilized Mike Pondsmith's official statement, the Cyberpunk Firestorm series, 2020, Red, Cyber Generation, and of course, the 2077 video game. A huge thanks to all the channel members up on screen as well. I appreciate every single one of you and hope you're having a great year so far. Same for all my other viewers, of course. So, make sure to have a great week. And I will see you later, Chooms.